at Port Avon. Let's do the amiable vagabonds thing. Seek out the court of the Skylarks. The camp has moved since the vagabond was here last. He stoops to examine a wooden post etched with dozens of signs. We call these the Skylark signals, says the vagabond. The post has been carved with dozens of crude hieroglyphs. Top secret. We carve them to tell each other the character of a port. He jabs at a row of zigzags. This means unfriendly. He points at a triangle. But this means there's a Skylark camp nearby. You follow him past the village's fringe. You hear voices raised in drunken song. Then you see a crumbling bridge, beneath which are campfires and tents. My loyal subjects, roars the vagabond, plunging down the slope. Stamping around the fire, singing of old adventures, howling and dancing and laughing. The Skylark's coats are ragged. Their hygiene is questionable, and many of them bear unsightly scars. But they seem to have found something to celebrate. Perhaps just that they've made it through the month. They raise their flasks and bottles in a toast and roar together. My life is a lark. My king is the sky. Listen to stories around a campfire. The vagabond is in his element, raising his voice above all others. Occasionally, one of the other Skylarks gets a turn. A Skylark hunches forward, his face skull-like in the firelight. He launches into a fanciful tale of somewhere hidden in the furthest corner of the Reach, called a Sugar Spun Garden. The Sugar Spun Garden is a mythical place where weary Skylarks can settle down. He describes whiskey rivers and marzipan mountains in a land without laws. The Skylark lucky enough to find his way here can sleep contentedly in a grove where even the trees are smiling. When he's finished, half the Skylarks are weeping. The vagabond raises his flask solemnly. Cinders swirl into the night sky. Trade Rumors a group of flint-eyed skylarks are blowing smoke rings and sharing what they've learned while they roam the high wilderness. They discuss where to find work in New Winchester, the price of beer in Lustrum, the balance of the Winchester War. And wilder rumors, too, of course. A wild-eyed skylark claims that the devils at Carillon are replacing people with doppelgangers. One woman, shivering, insists that she saw a hundred-eyed monster the size of a continent swimming through the dark. Lastly, a solemn young woman announces that a skylark named Quivers has gone missing. It's been months since he was seen at camp or at any stations. Probably dead. There are a thousand ways for a skylark to die before their time. Leave the camp. The party is dying down. Many of the Skylarks are asleep in their tents, or drifting back to the station in search of a ride. You search among the tents for the amiable vagabond and find him fast asleep beside a dwindling fire. A flea-bitten dog is gnawing at one of his boots. The Skylarks are quite happy to let their so-called king sleep it off in the dirt. You shake him and he wakes with a noise like a bear being stabbed. <laughs> Another fine meeting with my loyal subjects, declares the vagabond, lurching to his feet and swaying only slightly. Come, let us return to the engine. Adventure awaits. He sets off confidently in the wrong direction. The vag vagabond's respect for you has grown. Speak of the wonders in the sky. The vagabond has seemed uncharacteristically morose of late. Perhaps you can cheer him up. Since you left Port Avon, the Vagabond has limited his fiddle playing to the most melancholy refrains. Every time it leaves the Boilerman in such a tearful mess that he has to abandon his duties. You share a drink and a few stories with the Vagabond, hoping to get to the root of the matter. Even among Skylarks, I don't feel quite at home, he says. I can't stop thinking about my old homestead in Lustrum. Perhaps we could visit there someday. Ah, Captain, take this flask away from me. Whiskey and nostalgia is a dangerous combination. An old home in Lustrum, okay. 
Hey, let's go mining here. In the Cyclopean Ruins. Nocturnal excavation, 100% chance of success. Oh, what is this? This is unlocked when I have the attention of the Waste Wife. What is... What does that do? Enjoy the picturesque surroundings. How they roar. How tragic. How solemn. Like the most rampant visions of Turner. Your peace is interrupted by a tuneless whistling. A painter is here, meticulously recreating the ruins and oils on his tall canvas. He has made an addition. On a jut of stone, he has painted a rag-clad child sitting on the ground, its knees drawn up. Its skin is chalky white. Its back is to you, but its head is turned, one milky eye catching yours. You examine the ruins. There is no child there. Only the tumbled stone, the moss, and the wind that whistles through the ruins. You leave quickly. The walk has not been as soothing as you'd hoped. I guess that was just because it was a partial success. Oh, that's just outright failure. A milky mist billows across the sky. The stones pour cold shadows over you. They loom like stooping giants. You are so tiny, so fleeting. You hurry from their choking immensity, seeking the smaller familiar shapes of cottages, of trees, of locals leaning on their painted gates. Okay, I've worn out my welcome. Let's share some gossip. Welcome's at four. Let's get it up to six. And let's try again. Let's try again. <laughs> My God. My chance isn't that bad. 41? Worn on my welcome again. Up to two. Four. Six. Eight. Is this just impossible to pass? Like, is this 41% a lie and because I have the tension of the Waste Wife, it's just always going to fail? Like, because the Waste Wife is looking at me, I can't enjoy the picturesque surroundings? Is that... No, it's possible. I just was really unlucky. How vast were the beings that resided here? Were they kings? Was this their palace? You sit in the monumental shadow of a stone and watch the stars wheel above. What must they think, those stars, to see such grand ruins become the abode of such tiny, brief things? Nocturnal excavation. To get some undistinguished souls. This is very satisfying. No longer welcome. Okay, I think that's good. I'm gonna go back to New Winchester. Almost at New Winchester. Uh, I think that the Tacketys launched their own special ship in response to the London Monitor, so I'm assuming there's gonna be a dialogue about the new engine launch when I enter New Winchester, just like there was at London. Yeah, the Tackety's answer. Okay, well, I can do other stuff first. Just gonna sell all my surplus stuff above 20. Give me about 2,000. Alright, now let's check out the Tackety's answer. London's invention of the Monitor-class locomotive has sparked alarm in the reach. 
What are my friends going to come up with? The Tackities value their privacy and don't want Her Majesty's watchdogs freely prowling their skies. Word has it that the Indrit veteran has convinced the Colonial Assembly to invest in a proportionate response. Let's learn more about it. Ask around in the more independent-minded pubs of New Winchester. After four pubs and rather more than four drinks, you manage to learn the following. Firstly, the Tackities have embarked on a project to develop new locomotives of their own. It's only a matter of time until the first ones are completed. Secondly, that the work is taking place at the O'Brien factory at Lustrum. Thirdly, that the Tackities are desperate for donations of expertise or bronzewood to expedite the construction. Oh, hell yeah, I'm going to help my allies make some ships. Bring bronzewood or crew to Lustrum if you want to assist the Tackities. Bring munitions if you want to sabotage them. Hell no. Bronzewood and crew. I can do both. Yeah, let's um, get some crew. Twenty-three crew in total. That should be plenty to do a lot. Repair my locomotive. Let's do our ambition. We need to bring Meg back here. Part ways with Meg. She has been even surlier than usual during the return journey. Last night she knocked tentatively at your cabin door. Uh, tentatively, rather. I'm really curious where the quest is going to go from here, because this is the end of this part of the quest. Right? Return Meg to New Winchester, and then all these will be done. So then what after this? She sat on your desk, fiddling with her pouch of tobacco. Look, I hunt monsters, but I can't hunt a living fire that crawls out of my thoughts. And I don't know about you, but I've done stuff I can't afford to have written on the outside of me. She fell silent for a time. Here's what I can do, though. I can find our girl before the fire that follows does. I'm going to track her down. If I catch a whiff, I'll get a message to you. She shook your hand. Good flying with you. Meg will turn her efforts towards finding your friend. Good. Put the pieces together. I'm scared about what that's going to do. Let's do it. You have a picture now of what the earnest agitator was pursuing and how. The Hypocrisy of Sons. With the Baroness, you learned that stars can only be killed by beings of comparable magnitude. With a didact, you found that thousands of stars have died in a secret civil war. With the Citizen, you learned that the courtesy a pact between the stars determines the procedures by which they may murder one another. With Meg, you discover that the courtesy conceals the existence of the bloodshed. If you learn the truth, you are hunted by the fire that follows. If your friend discovered all this and more, the fire must have been hunting her. But where would she have tried to hide from it? Can you hide from the fire that follows in a place like Eleutheria because it's dark? Place plunged into lawless night? Meg has found a lead. Search for your friend. Fortunately, Meg's search for the earnest agitator has borne fruit. She and the bedeviled didact seek you out. The Azazel, or Azazel, was seen passing lustrum and heading over the edge towards the wastes. Oh god, says Meg. The didact looks grim. The wastes are starless spaces, cold and barren, haunted by evil winds. She cannot survive there. You have a choice now. Follow your friend in pursuit of the truth, or abandon your ambition and its perils. It is not too late, for you at least. 
you could still seek wealth or fame instead of this quest into forbidden secrets, which can have no good end. If you choose to continue this unwise pursuit, travel off the edge of the reach and search for your friend. You will need a store of supplies and fuel. If you choose to abandon your ambition, you can do so here. This sounds rather permanent. This sounds like the end. I'm going to assume that this is going to end the game. For this captain, anyway. So I don't think I'm going to do it until I've done everything else I want to. Passen Lustrum. So... They went off here. I could also go off here, near the Grave of the Silent Saint. That feels weirdly appropriate. How many ways off the map are there? Is it just around Lustrum? Oh, uh, looks like there's one over here, too. Yeah, there's, there's a few. Persist with your quest. You will not turn back now. Is it loyalty, curiosity, or do you have more ambitious aims? After all, you have learned that sons can die. <laughs> yes, I have. I've learned that there may be loopholes. Does it... Is there any reason for me not to choose persist with my quest? At over attend to other matters? Like, I still have to go off the map, so... I'm gonna click it. The earnest agitator's engine, the Azazel, is seen heading towards the wastes. You must follow her to where all maps fail. Travel beyond the edge of the map to search for your friend. Should you come to your senses before you find her, you may return here to abandon your quest. Okay, so you can still abandon it, even after kind of accepting it. They're giving me a lot of opportunities to back out. Hmm. Oh, hey! Another one of these things. Up here, right by Lustrum. Uh, okay, we got some other things to take care of first. <laughs> They're kind of attacking each other. Let's see what options I missed before. Let's get rid of this one over here so I don't hear that horribly loud noise. Success, great, more bronze wood. Ha. <sighs> so before I try to render the fungus edible, I could destroy them. That will probably reduce my terror. Or dig under the fungus for precious stones. Sometimes fossils or gemstones can be prized. I don't know if that's meant to be pronounced prized or pride, but they mean the same thing. Uh, pride from a cantankerous carapace. You'll have to carve your way through the fungus, though. The fungal sheath is tough, fibrous. It must be dug out by the roots, which sprout between the cantankerous segmented plates. You use a sharpened trowel and leather-gloved fingers, beneath a glitter of valuable stones. 59 sovereigns? That's nothing. I guess being in the reach, you know, even though they're monstrosities, they're not the highest level enemies. Ooh. 
Ooh, hello. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, saying this thing. I saw in the patch notes, notes that they also mentioned more interesting encounters for people who assay. I've assayed some stuff on the way here, and so far none of them have actually had encounters, but I guess some do. A celestial ruin. <clears throat> the heavens are pocked with tumbled ruins from eons ago. Some are melancholy, some malevolent, some high treasures, others danger. Here is an ivy ruin of the reach, graceful with arches and bristled with sprouts of moss and mushrooms. Leave or decipher ancient inscriptions, trade visions of the heavens for a moment of inspiration and some experience. That sounds amazing. Or conduct an excavation. How many visions of the heavens? Four. Only four? For a moment of inspiration? That's even better than the Grievers in Eleutheria. I've got to do that. But, um, what's the expedition take? This ruin seems more intact than some. If you have the workers and equipment, you could risk digging deeper in, uh, deeper in to see what treasures they hold. I'm curious about this one, but I need moments of inspiration as always. The inscriptions are written in the language of the suns. You decipher what you can. They hint at a number of feuding solar alliances or conjunctions. Each conjunction upholds a different philosophy, as obtuse and fiery as the stars themselves. Don't I know it. At Lustrum, I join the celebrations, drank some tea, all that good stuff to reduce terror. It also turns out that I had 24 nameplates to turn into Sweet Jane, which gained me two more moments of inspiration. So now I have enough to get me down a, another nightmare if I wanted to. Maybe I do. Anyway, we got a couple things to do here. First, let's visit the O'Brien factory. I want to help the Tacketys make a new ship. A busy factory in the outskirts of Lustrum's sprawling shantytown. I have the very, very, very slight hope that after I help them make the ship, maybe they'd be willing to sell me one because I'm part of their faction. But I don't think so. That would have been mentioned in the patch notes, right? Busy factory in the outskirts of Lustrum's sprawling shantytown. Here, the Tacketys are hard at work on their own answer to London's new monitor-class locomotives. Security is high, but the project relies on donations of expertise and resources from sympathetic communities. I need two Bronzewood to do this. I've got 11 on me. Yeah, let's donate Bronzewood. Bronzewood is used for plating, particularly on war engines, and the Tacketys need an enormous amount of it. You unload the Bronzewood before the factory gates, where a tobacco whiskered foreman orders it taken inside. As the doors swing open, you catch a glimpse of a behemoth of a locomotive, bulked with layer upon patchwork layer of plating. New reputation with the Tacketys? 442. <laughs> Some of your crew will leave permanently. Oh, it's going to take 10 of my crew? Wow. That's probably going to help them a lot, though. Let's do it. Perhaps some of your crew would rather work somewhere with solid ground beneath their feet. The Tacketys could certainly use their expertise. Oh, it wasn't all 10 that went, just 5. A number of engineers take you up on the offer and you release them from your service. A tobacco-whiskered foreman swears them to secrecy on a battered Bible, then finds them work in the factory. Despite their oath, the next time you see some of your ex-engineers, they can't resist talking shop. They're alarmed by the goings-on in Shed 12 where they concoct the incendiaries. I wonder if I just keep doing it, is it going to be finished right now? Let's just give them more Ronswood. Just give them all my Bronzewood. I could give them more crew, too. I totally could spare it. Uh, 
Oh, I think that did it. Check on progress. Things have changed at the factory. Activity, activity has shifted from development to production. Liberators lumber out of the engine sheds. Heavy armored engines that act as mobile repair and resupply points for the lighter Tackety Scouts. Each has a pair of huge cylindrical tanks mounted on its back to hold the fuel for its experimental, some would say cobbled together, fire belchers. The Tacketys are in high spirits. You will now encounter Tacketty Liberators while exploring. Awesome. So they have flamethrowers on them? So it's like a huge flamethrower that's heavily armored. That sounds really cool. And so different from the London Monitors too. Right, London Monitor is like small and sleek and lightly armored and snipes from afar. This thing's an up-close, fire-spewing, heavily armored juggernaut. Let's do the Vagabonds thing. You follow the Vagabond past Lustrum's outskirts into the whirling whiteness beyond. Miles from civilization, you find a mansion half buried in snow, perched on a rocky outcrop. The Vagabond wades to the door and slams on the iron knocker. After some time, the door eases open. A dotery butler peers out, his face so downcast it looks half-melted. <laughs> Welcome back, sir, says the tragic butler wearily. A letter was delivered in your absence. Wait, there's... You're a Vagabond, but you own a mansion on Lustrum? Also, it's half buried in snow, perched on a rocky outcrop, and this, um, this butler has just been living in here, waiting for this person to come back, just stuck in the snow. <laughs> Sounds miserable. Ask how the vagabond could afford such a place. Ten bedrooms, a kitchen that could staff a dozen cooks, a chandelier that drips with diamonds. Princes have lived less ostentatiously. Ah, you should have seen it in its heyday. The vagabond rubs his hands before the fire. Warm, noisy, bustling with staff and guests. Our parties could be heard in New Winchester. Isn't that right? Quite so, sir, says the tragic butler. I struck it lucky in the mountain, you see, says the vagabond. Found enough hours to make me rich. Rich enough to buy all this and more besides. He claps you on the back. All the luxury in the world can't compare to the majesty of the open sky, though. Right, comrade? What a strange person. Let's explore the mansion. The vagabond has shrugged out of his coat and is leaping, heaping logs on the fire. You have a few moments to roam the place. The mansion is colossal, its walls built with bronzewood logs, its bathrooms gleaming with ivory, its walls decorated with gold-framed portraits of a younger, better-groomed vagabond. But it's also obviously been years since it was properly maintained. Some of the windows are broken and snow has heaped the floor beneath. Black mold streaks the carpet. There's an overpowering smell of damp. Let's ask about the butler's letter. He's been brandishing the envelope for more than half an hour now. Just give me the gist of it, will you? Asks the vagabond, idly tossing snowballs at a portrait of a severe-looking woman in black. <laughs> the butler clears his throat. The letter was delivered by a skylark who calls himself Quivers, sir. In it, he claims to have discovered the location of the sugar-spun garden. He was seeking your help. The vagabond pauses mid-throw. But that's a myth. A story to tell over campfires when the night is cold and hungry. He sounds uncertain for a moment, then shrugs. Young Quivers means well, but he must have been mistaken. Quivers is the one we just heard had gone missing. <clears throat> the vagabond sips his whiskey before the fireplace telling rambling stories about the parties he threw in the mansion's better days. The tragic butler stands to one side, mournfully dignified. Spend the night at the mansion. The blizzard outside has worsened. Best you stay until the morning. 
You stay up into the night. Your conversation is meandering, but the vagabond repeatedly circles back to the mysterious letter. I'm worried for quivers, he says. The other Skylarks haven't seen him in months, and he comes to my house babbling about a myth? The next morning, the butler says his plaintive goodbyes. As you crunch through the snow towards Lustrum, the vagabond says he plans to track down quivers. What kind of a king would I be if I didn't protect my subjects, he asks. Besides, I once believed in the sugar spun garden myself. I must admit, I'm curious. Ask about their plan. A Skylark claimed to have found the mythical sugar spun garden and came to seek the Vagabond's help. How does the Vagabond hope to find him? I've been making inquiries, says the amiable Vagabond. Quivers was in a traveling Skylark band named the Blunt Instruments. They weren't very good, but they robbed the bars they performed at, so they made enough to get by. <laughs> I'd thought the rest of them were killed in a shootout last year. He beams triumphantly. Except there was one other survivor. A concertina player who goes by the charming epithet of Ratbite. She's currently imprisoned in London for some marvelous crimes. I propose we break her out and see if she's heard from her old partner in crime. Break Quiver's old partner in crime, Ratbite, from prison in London so you can learn more about where he went. Well, I think this is a pretty good place to end the episode. So I hope you've enjoyed so far, and when I return, I think I'm going to head back to London to break out Ratbite.